Hello and welcome along to something quite different today on the channel with me, Daniel. As promised over the last couple of weeks, I've been planning and I'm recording my first ever experiment. Now, it's not going to be a traditional experiment that you used to seeing all over YouTube. We've given all these clubs a billion pound in England and seeing if they can rise to the top. We're not going to put all of the top English sides into the bottom playable league. What we're going to do is something a bit more niche, something that suits the leagues we use in FM and something that particularly suits what we've been doing in FM21. So as you can see, we're starting this episode in the FM editor, and we're going to be talking about the Welsh Premier League, something that we've become very familiar with in our Build a Nation story from Panga City. So if you're looking forward to seeing what we're doing, if you're looking forward to seeing how it pans out, and the sort of outcomes we're looking to get, then please do put a thumbs up on the video, subscribe down below for regular content from two long-term stories, and a few more special bits like this come in as well. You can follow us over on Twitch too. But today is all about my first ever experiment. So it is my first one, so go gentle on me. And it is going to be quite niche. So don't expect fireworks immediately. This is just something I was genuinely interested in. So we're going to have a go. We're going to set this up. And then we're going to go 10 years in the future and see how it's progressed. If you enjoy it and you want to see more, of course, and see us go another 10 years in the future, then let me know down in the comments. And I'm more than happy to holiday and do that. But I just wanted to get a feel for what these clubs' priority would be. Because as the title gives away, we're going to set some Welsh sugar daddies. So what I've done is I've picked sort of all of the Premier League sides in Wales. And sort of the top 10 reputation ones outside the top tier. And given them all a little bit of a boost financially. So we're not talking about we're going to give them all a billion pound and break all of the rules and all of the usual bits set up in the editor. Because if we do that, we're not going to learn anything. If you give everyone a billion pound, they're going to become rich. They're going to do very well. They're going to go pro. They're going to update all the facilities. They're going to start spending big money. So I wanted to make sure that it was proportionate to the league and it was proportionate for how it would affect them in long-term football planning. So what we've done, if we go and have a look at the teams that are taking part in the Welsh Premier League, is we've set all of the sides to have background sugar daddies. So these aren't people who are in the forefront throwing money about, but they're sort of wealthy benefactors looking after the club in the background. And you can see that what we've done is without making any of the reputation changes, any of the league changes, we have simply just changed the balance to the highest that they can have for their current reputation, their current league, and with a background sugar daddy. So what you can see is based on reputation here, we go from highest to lowest. The professional side TNS can have a maximum balance of 43.7 million. Whereas Connors Key is only 27.5, going all the way down to Flint Town, who have got the lowest reputation, who have done really well to get up to that league, and they can only have 7.7. .7. We're not going to change anything else. No changes to facilities, to reputation, even to transfer and wage budgets for the first year. Because we want to see how the clubs are going to invest. Are they going to use that money to go professional? Are they going to use it on facilities? Are they going to use it all on transfers? How is it going to affect the dynamic domestically? All of those things are what we want to see. Are we maybe even going to get a new stadium or two? Despite the fact that the league traditionally has low attendances. So I was really intrigued to see which sort of approach these clubs would take. And what it would mean for Welsh football. Because in our save with Bangor City... We've been really frustrated by the lack of development of other teams in the league, even as the league reputation has increased. Whereas if we look at our live stream series with Dundee United on YouTube, TNS have already had two years in the Europa Conference group stages. So I was sort of interested to see whether TNS would fly off as a professional side with a bigger balance, or would it be that the league gets a bit narrower and closer together? So all of that we're going to find out in a moment. But as well as the Welsh Premier, I did promise I'd done it for a few other clubs. So if we go to the North, basically we've gone for all of the sides who have got more than 1,000 reputation. So the top five in the North, which includes Bangor City, our club in that Builder Nation series. The likes of Colwyn Bay, who have moved from the English leagues. And then Landudno, Airbus and Prestatyn. All sides that have been in the top tier recently. If we go to the South, just the five in there. And three of those are only just. So Cambrian and Clydak, Port Talbot and Athen Lido. And then Carmarthen and Laletney Town, who are more regulars in the top tier in our Builder Nation. We've also thrown one wild card in as well. So we've gone for the reformed real side. But again, if I click on the side that aren't extinct this time, you can see I've given them the maximum budget. So all of them have this set up. They've got the maximum balance that's allowed to them, given their reputation and the league they're in. They've got a background sugar daddy who can increase their starting finances and keep pumping money in later down. But we're not setting them to be an all-singing, all-dancing owner. So that's the position we're in. That's what we've set up. 
What we're going to go and do now is get into FM, holiday 10 years in the future, and see what the clubs have prioritised, number one, whether the league's been able to increase its reputation domestically and in Europe, whether the clubs have been going for big transfers, where they've been signing their players from, and what Welsh football looks like. Is it still going to be TNS flying at the top, perhaps with Connors Key joining in, or is it going to be a 4-5-6 horse race, or a free-for-all where everyone's rotating? I'm really looking forward to finding out because I said when I did an experiment on this channel, I'd want it to be one I genuinely won't know the answer to. I don't know what they're going to prioritise. Are we going to get in and find that TNFs have spent a million pound on three or four players? Or are we going to go in and find that they've got great facilities? I don't know. And that's what I'm looking forward to. So let's go and skip into FM. And we'll be back in a moment to see what it looks like. So here we are in our more familiar habitat of the FM21 game. We're 10 years in the future, we've loaded up that database and we have holidayed. We're now on the 10th of June 2030 and we're going to see what's happened to Welsh football. So we're going to have a look at a few things. We're going to look at the transfer window for the last 10 years. We're going to look at who's been winning the league, how they've been getting on, whether any sides have managed to break through and get into the European group stages. We'll look at the coefficient and that side of it as well. And we'll also, of course, have a look at individual clubs to see A, what their financial state is now, B, whether they've upgraded their facilities, their stadium or any of those sorts of things. And C, whether they've still got anything left in the bank. So let's go and have a look. We're going to start by heading over to the Welsh Premier League table. And fingers crossed, we're not going to get a nasty surprise. Because there could be the opportunity that these sides have all cancelled each other out. And I genuinely don't know what's happening here. What I can see is just from searching the league, the holders are Lanetley Town, who started in the second tier. So, somebody's used their money well, haven't they? Let's go and have a look at the Premier League. So, Colwyn Bay win the European playoffs. Barry and TNS still up there. But my word, look at the title the last five years. Five different winners. So, going back, we've got Lynetley, Airbus, Colwyn Bay, Barry. Two for TNS. Three for Bangor City before that. So, they came up from the second tier and immediately won three league titles in a row. That's significantly better than we managed. TNS won it the first year, as you'd probably expect. But that's really interesting. And look how tight it is. One point separating the top three teams. Fantastic season at the top there. And now we've just got to see how those sides are bared in Europe. And we're going to have a lot to get through, of course, as well. But before we do that, we'll have a look at some of the star players and what they might be rated like. But let's first have a look at the transfer windows and see how much has been spent in the Welsh Premier League the last few years. And more importantly, what sort of clubs the players are signing them from? Is it domestic transfers? Are they competing with England for League 2, the National League, League 1? Let's go and have a look. So putting them in value order, I wouldn't say that's anywhere near as much as we expected. It's sort of a half and half mix of players coming from either England or from the Welsh League. There's not anything from further afield outside of the domestic leagues, outside of the UK, for example. Not even the Republic of Ireland. But there is a lot more from England than we've seen perhaps in our builder nation. The record transfers seem to be ones that are domestic. So Penny Bont to Barrytown United. 140,000 is the most this season from Paul Harding. He's not a very good player, but he's a youngster. So perhaps that makes sense. Let's just go back to previous years because I'm a little underwhelmed by that first one. Okay, so the year before, again, domestic transfers the top two, but there's a lot more from England that year. So maybe last season's just a one-off. There's also a lot going the other way. So like the fact that Flint are selling players to Watford suggests that maybe they're bringing through some good youngsters. Sean Ray, he is quite good at 22. So I think that's a positive sign as well. But let's have a look at the record transfers before. Eon McDonald, 245 grand, Bangor to Bala. He is... Another decent young player. And Charles, the goalkeeper, is okay as well. So not setting the world alight, but they're decent domestic transfers. And that suggests the league reputation might be a bit better. Let's go back another year before that. We've got another increase. 300,000 from Barla to Barry. Oh, wow, he's a lot better. So actually, there's some very good players knocking about in the Welsh Premier League. And there's a lot of transfers domestically for big money. But also quite a few from the English non-league and maybe a few from League 2 as well. Just going back again, we've got quite a few big ones there. I think that's the biggest one we've seen from England to Wales, which is 88,000 rising to 115. That's Kalala, who's gone from Ebb's Fleet to Connors Key. And he looks pretty good as well as a centre-half. So there is a decent standard in the league. 
Certainly not setting the world alight in the first 10 years, but there's a lot of decent sized transfers going along. Let's keep going back. 190,000 again is the best one there. Seems like Barry are the king of domestic transfers. But certainly nothing to set the world alight just yet. There's none of those big million pound transfers or all the money getting invested there. As we keep going back, if anyone was going to blow it, it probably would have been at the start. So let's make sure that's not happening. There's a few England to Wales transfers for over 100 grand there. They're TNS largely. If we keep going back, we've got 76,000, 145,000, but that's a domestic one. And then 32,000 and 4.8. So actually, the transfer windows have gradually got bigger as they've gone along. Even Press has left Wales there in the first season. That's a shame. He was a very good player for us. But I don't think there's anything set in the world alike there. So the money hasn't just been blown on transfers. For me, that's probably a positive. It might mean a slower development of the league. But if it means a lot more brilliant youngsters are coming through, and that's where the talent is, then potentially that could be a huge positive. So having looked at the transfers, having looked at the league, we're going to move on and have a look at how individual clubs have done in Europe and how they've done facilities-wise, what they've spent their money on and where they are now. But before that, let's get a little indicator and a little sneak preview by having a look at the Welsh coefficient. Well, that's pretty underwhelming in truth. There's no massive increase to the coefficient. They're up to 40th. I think one of the biggest things you've got to look at there is the fall from grace of Sweden. They are right down there. The likes of Moldova moving up massively. But that's certainly a surprise. But there are a few decent years in there with sort of two, two and a half in terms of coefficient. So I wonder if over the nation, somebody's had a good year somewhere. If we look at the qualification places, I don't think 40th makes any difference. It doesn't. It's towards the top end of that. But unfortunately, we're not quite seeing that big change around yet. So into the club coefficient, and we're looking for who might stand out. So TNS, they've got eight overall. And let's be fair, they've got a year with four and a half. So they must have reached the group stages of something. Barry have got a year with three, and theirs is nine overall. So they've arguably been the most consistent in Europe. It doesn't look like TNS have been there for three years. But Barry have had a year there where they've reached the playoff or the group stages for sure. Colwyn Bay have had a 2.5. They're becoming a little bit stronger. Otherwise, there's not really a huge amount to it, is there? So I think they're the three really we're looking at. Bangor City early in the save, of course, we'll look at because they had three years where they won the league in a row. But aside from that, there's definitely no years where somebody's reached the group stages because the last five has been very quiet there. We'll, of course, go and look to see if there were any odd shocks in the first few years, though. In fact, I've just discovered we can do it even easier than that. We're going to do the 10-year club coefficient, which is used for the revenue. So TNS have been pretty consistent until the last couple of years. Unfortunately, they've just fallen away. Barrytown United we'd looked at already. Colwyn Bay are recent bloomers. Bangor City did have one decent year, back in the third or fourth season. And who's that other one there? Connors Key have had a few playoffs maybe, but two's their best year, so they haven't reached the group stages. And otherwise, no, there's not any massive shocks. So I think the European side of it is going to be a little bit disappointing. Should we have a look at where the league stands in terms of reputation? So actually, the Welsh Premier League's not doing that bad. It's not far off where we've taken it to Bangor City, which if you consider some of our European runs is a bit of a surprise. So 1.5 star, but it's the highest league rated as such. So if it gets one more good year next season, and we might holiday in the future to see, if enough of you want to see it, we'll go and do it. It could overtake League 2. It could get to that level. And then do the finances make a difference? I guess that's a big question to be asked. We might have to look at what like the broadcast revenue and things like that are for the league as well. Because all of that could have an impact. But potentially, the Welsh Premier League is starting to look up. It's just a bit of a slower build across the nation. And I think that's more because different clubs have succeeded each year. If it had been one or two just shining throughout, I think the rise probably would have been quicker. But maybe not so many clubs would have stayed richer or maybe been able to improve, which I'm hoping is what we'll see next. But although not exactly what we wanted to see, certainly some promising signs, now let's go and have a look at some of the individual clubs, and perhaps see who's been succeeding and benefiting the most in recent years. So just very quickly while we're here, we're not going to have a look at the broadcast revenue as such, but the placement revenue has gone up a little for where they finish in the league. So that suggests there is going to be a bit of a difference there, and hopefully that's a positive sign, because if the revenue is increasing, the league reputation is... Hopefully the clubs within the country will as well. But let's go and have a look at some of those individual clubs. And we'll start with this season's champions, Lanetney Town. So some big positives and alarming negatives in equal measure. 
They only came up from the second tier last year and they've won the league, which is remarkable. Their key player, we're just going to do that for each club. Have a look at their key player. Luke Morton. Oh, wow. That's sort of the level of our Bangor City players, that. Luke Morton looks a superstar. He's gone out of the Leicester Academy and gone to Lanetley Town and he's not even Welsh. That's massive. I think the Welsh League is on the brink of something here based on that. That could be really interesting if we keep skipping into the future. So let me know if that's something you'd like to see. Because that's a really promising sign. The other positive is that Lynetley Town are professional. So considering they've spent most of their time in the second tier, I'm hoping a lot of clubs will have spent their money on going pro. However, the negative is they've got insecure finances. So does that mean that they've blown it all on something else? Or have they been able to sustain it by getting the facilities up? Okay, that's quite promising. No change to the ground, but they've now got good training facilities, adequate youth facilities, average academy coaching. Okay, the youth recruitment's not caught up, but considering this side before this year have never been in Europe, that's really impressive and would suggest they've spent most of their money on that. I just want to make sure they're not being shredded by wages. They're not. The wages are really, really low. Luke Morton only on loan. That's a bit of a shame, actually. I didn't notice that. But still, nobody on more than 400 quid a week, they've spent their money off the pitch. And okay, it's running out now, but they're in Europe next year. And if they keep players like Morton about, they might well reach the group stages. So a positive start. Let's move on to the next two clubs in the table who have had a lot more success over the 10 years. Barrytown United, first of them. Professional. Finances secure. And they've been right up near the top every season. So their star player is Joe Ling. He is contracted the club, not a lone player, and he's very good. He's a former Crystal Palace youngster. So actually, it looks like the Welsh League have managed to get a lot of UK talent out of Premier League academies. And again, he's quite a big upgrade on what we're used to seeing. A lot more of a wage, 725 quid a week, and they have got some big earners. But they're very good footballers. Jonah Curry looks a quality player. Chris Forkip, very much the same. This is a good side. Okay, Edwards, perhaps not so much, but a good side and good experience. Now, let's see what they've done to the facilities because these guys have been the bigger spenders in the window, haven't they? But despite that, again, no stadium upgrade. They've got adequate training, adequate youth and adequate junior coaching. So again, they've spent a lot of that money off the pitch. And I think this is going to be a real good thing for them moving forward. Now, Barry have been in Europe a lot of years as well. So let's quickly see if they reach the group stages at all. They got to the third qualifier this year in the Europa Conference. Second the year before. Ah, three years ago, Barry Town United. They must have won the league that year because they started in the Champions League. But they were in the Europa Conference group stages. And it looks like they've even picked up a point there at home to Vaduz. That's a very strange group. But they have managed to get a point and they've been in the group stages. That's a real big positive. Let me very quickly glimpse through the previous years just to see if it's happened again before that. It doesn't look like it. But one team has made the European group stages. That's a good sign and Barry have invested well. Next up is TNS. Still got the bigger reputation. Secure finances. They won the league a few years but they've had some dodgy seasons as well. Their key player is Dave Stone. Scott Rusko still in charge. He's a 20-year-old winger who looks excellent. Again, out of the Southampton Academy. He's a wonderful talent. Really good player. Better than probably most we've got at Bangor City in the Builder Nation. And definitely better than anything we've seen at TNS. In terms of the club itself, where have they spent their money? Facilities? Very decent. Good training facilities and average or adequate for everything else. So actually, a lot of this money's been spent sensibly. They've stayed professional, of course. Let's have a very quick look at whether they've reached the group stages at all. So interestingly, TNS haven't been in the group stages yet. However, they did make the playoffs two years in a row, which is where those bigger sort of inflations in the coefficient were. But no group stage football for TNS. Perhaps a slight disappointment, but still doing pretty well. The other ones that have been up there are Colwyn Bay. Professional. One and a half star reputation, which suggests they've been doing well somewhere. Their finance is only okay though, so let's see where that's gone. Brooke Norton Cuffey is their key player. And he looks a pretty decent one as well. Now transfer listed. Maybe it's because he won't sign a new contract perhaps. Yeah, it's absolutely that. But a really good player again. Let's have a look at where the money's been spent. Now this one's a little more interesting. Yes, they've upgraded the training and youth facilities. But the rest hasn't had an upgrade. 
So I know they were one of the bigger spenders in the transfer window in recent years. Although it's still only a few thousand pounds. We're not talking hundreds and hundreds. So I wonder where their money's gone, to be honest. If we have a look at the squad, is it wages perhaps? There's a few big earners at the club, Norton Cuffey being one of them. And actually on paper their squad doesn't look as good. Until we get to Alimbi, who looks a proper talent. Archie Collins is a very good player. So actually they've gone for a bit more experience and an overall bigger wage bill. So is it just that they've not succeeded in Europe? Let's go and have a quick look. So actually they've had very few stints in Europe. But however, last season, not the most recent one, the one before... They did get to the playoff in the Europa Conference, though didn't quite make it to the group stages. And that was the year after they won the league. So a very decent progression. But actually, the way the clubs are being built is really promising here. So let's go and have a look at some of the other sides. Bangor City won three titles in a row early on. They're professional. They've got secure finances. Their key player is Luke Walsh, who is excellent. Let's have a look at the facilities. Good training facilities, adequate youth facilities, average academy coaching. They're all pretty decent. Now let's have a look at whether they got into Europe at all in the early stages. So again, the best we had from them was a playoff, which was in the third season, but never quite made the groups themselves. But the money's still there. The league's building well. It just feels like it needs another 10 years, doesn't it? Connors Key were another one of the big sides at the start. They're still professional. They're secure. Their star player, Joe Gareth, is very good. And again, I'm just looking to see. It seems to be a very familiar pattern. Off the pitch work is the main thing being done. What I'm going to go and do is I'm going to look at any other sides that have won the league quickly. And then we'll just take a general view. So I think we've only missed Airbus out of those so far. Let's have a look at them. So Airbus, OK finances, professional status. They've got the top scorer in the league in Charlie Caton. And look at him. He's a proper talent. Where is he at the start of the game? He's at Shrewsbury. He's gone on loan to Fylde and he's a great talent, wonderful player. And he's played in Europe this year, so Airbus must have been there. What have they spent their money on though? They've got good facilities, they're average across the board there. But it doesn't look like they've set the world alight in Europe. Certainly not made any real big progression. So I think we've only got the one side that have made the group stages at any point. Let's go and have a look through them quickly. I'll go and have an overlook at all of the clubs. And then we'll see if there's anything that stands out. But it looks like most clubs have turned professional. Most are increasing their facilities. And none of them have really gone mad on transfers. But we'll look for any little outliers. And we'll be back to finish off in a moment. So unfortunately, no greater European success. No other big results anywhere else. However, there are a few outliers in terms of what money's been spent on. And what's going on at clubs. So the first of those is Flint Town. Of course, they started as the smallest club in the Welsh Premier League. They've just gone down again here. With 7.7 .7 million. They are still semi-professional. They're now insecure. They've had at least one season in Europe quite recently. Where they were second in the league. And they had one actually the second season. So they must have done really well the first year. They went out in the first qualifier there. Let's keep going ahead. And they got all the way to the third qualifier a couple of years ago. So I'm not sure where the money's dried up so quickly. Have they got a particularly big wage bill? Something like that. They have got quite a big one. That seems a little bit of a surprise. But yeah, insecure finances and it's still semi-pro. That was a little bit of a surprise to me because everyone else in this top tier is professional now. Even Carnarvon who finished bottom. The biggest news though is Cambrian and Clydak who have finished sixth. Now they're professional. Yes, their budget is now insecure. Their finances aren't looking great. Their key player is a decent one. But the big news is in the facilities. They are due to move into a 14,500-seater stadium this October. That's astonishing. I didn't expect to see that. So that's going to be really interesting to see how that affects their finances and whether it affects the way they can grow. Let's move on to the other tiers, though, just so we can have a look at some key bits of info. And here was the other bit of information that blew my mind. The highest wage bill in the league is Landudno, and by a long way as well. And Landudno are a side who have not finished in the top two at any point. They've still got secure finances. They've still got a professional status. They've got decent facilities. But it looks like more than any, they've invested on the pitch rather than off it. They've got a player on three and a half grand a week. We haven't even got that at Bangor City. And we've been to the latter stages in Europe. They've got a decent right back. They've got Jamie Sule, who was once a very good youngster in game. And they've got a few other decent players. But I don't know that given the highest wage bill in the league, their squad really warrants it. And it's certainly not a balanced squad, so I'm a little bit perplexed by that one. 
but the general standard of players isn't too bad at all. Let's go and have a look at the North and South. Another club with a pretty big wage bill, this time in the second tier, is Prestatin. Now, they've been in the second tier the whole series. They've not been able to get promoted. They have gone professional. They've still got secure finances. Their star player, I would argue, is one of the better ones we've encountered across the country. However, their facilities haven't really improved. They've never gone up. It's a little bit of an odd one, that. And in the south, we meet our next interesting thing. Probably the final one we'll look at. Monmouth. Now, this is the most astounding thing. Monmouth were not one of the sides that we gave big money to at the start. They are not one of the 22 teams that were selected. They didn't have money. I don't know where it's come from. But they have moved into a 14,500-seater stadium. Can somebody please tell me how that's happened? They are professional. Yes, their finances are now insecure. It was built in 2025. And I'm really perplexed. I did not expect to see that. I'd argue it's the surprise of the series. They actually dropped out of the playable leagues the very season they moved into that stadium. And in fact, it looks like they've started outside the top two tiers. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. If we look at their key player... It's decent enough, but how have they got that money? How have they had the money to build a new stadium? Their facilities are still awful. I don't understand if they sold someone for massive money, but we haven't seen any big transfers. And you can't imagine in the lower leagues, they'd have a big reputation financially. I really don't know what to make of that. They've not been in Europe. They've not been in the top tier. They weren't even in the playable leagues at the start. So how have they ended up with a 15,000-seater stadium? Is it something that was planned, perhaps, already at the start of the game? That's the only thing I can think. That's the surprise for me out of everything. A club that we didn't give any money to, a club that weren't in the playable leagues, have come up to the second tier and have got a 15,000-seater new stadium. That's astonishing. But let me know what you think of our first ever experiment. I didn't really know what to expect, which, as I said, is why I wanted to do it. And I'm really both intrigued and quite impressed with where the Welsh League has spent the money. I think it's a real positive sign that they focused off the pitch. If we're looking at these key players. We've looked at Caton. We're looking at Bierreff there. They're really good footballers. So the Welsh League is definitely improving a little bit. If we're looking at the best players in the league on average rating. If we're looking at the top cis makers. They're really decent footballers. So the standard is improving. There's been one or two flirtations with European group stage football. Barry have been in there once. And actually, there's a real good foundation in this country now. So I'm really intrigued to see how it progresses. I think I would like to skip ahead another 10 years, even just for my own sake, to see how it goes. But if it's something you'd like to see more of, to find out what happened the second time around, 10 years further down the line in 2040, then please do let me know down in the comments. Please do chuck a big thumbs up on this video. Let me know if you enjoyed it, if there's anything else you'd like to see. And of course, whether you'd like to see the next 10 years or not, subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on for daily content from Two Long Term Stories. The head coach continues under the director of football model and our Bangor City Builder Nation. We know Wales very well in that one and it continues to take shape in our long term story. Thank you so much for your incredible support both over here and on the Twitch channel too. There's a link to all the playlists in the eye above and the Twitch in the description below. But thank you for watching as always. I really hope you enjoyed my first ever experiment. And I'll see you next time for more daily FM content and potentially a second episode of this if you'd like. Let me know and I'll see you next time. <laughs>